lovely, isn't it? Well, welcome to the service tonight. Um, you might not have noticed, but we have got one or two uh, of the new Langford links, the September edition, trying to get it a little bit earlier for a change, and uh, gradually trying to get back to normal schedule as much as is possible in the circumstances. And we do welcome you, and uh, although it will be delayed before they see this, we welcome our friends who will see this online uh, later on. We were blessed this morning and grateful as always to uh, the music uh, provided for us and uh, able to take some advantage of the new rules whereby a small group can now sing. And we're very grateful uh, to our musician uh, for that. Thank you very much. Now, later this evening, uh, we will be continuing with Acts chapter 7. We looked at the first part, the first 16 verses uh, this morning, split into two Lord's Days over four sessions. It's a long chapter. And uh, we look to the Lord to help us as we do that. On Tuesday, it is the Bible study and prayer meeting at 7.45 p.m. That again is on Zoom and will be led again this week by Kiprop with help from Chirop. And we are grateful to them. Wednesday, I shall be taking a half-day holiday. You probably can guess it's the second half of the day that I shall be taking. It's a happy occasion. It's my brother's silver wedding anniversary, but he's not very well. So do play, pray for uh, Chris, please, and his wife, Karen, at this time. And uh, then again on Thursday, by Zoom, we have the home prayer group at 10 a.m. <clears throat> please join us for prayer. It's not a private prayer meeting and it's good for folk to, to pray. Surely we need to pray more, not less, at this time in these situations. The usual announcements, please observe social distancing rules and use the hand gel when you arrive and leave. Please leave your name and contact number on the slip provided in case of contact tracing being necessary. We do have some free masks, if you forget any time to bring one, we have some there on the table and we do have a stock available. And uh, an advance notice of uh, myself and the on secretary will be on holiday, not this week, but next week, commencing Monday the, the 7th of September. But next Lord's Day is the 6th of September Morning worship at 11, evening worship at 6.30. God willing, I shall be the preacher. And with the Lord's help, we will continue with the book of Acts, chapter 7. And next week, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper will be observed at the evening service. Thank you. Shall we pray and then read the scriptures? Our Father and our God, we do thank you with grateful hearts that we can gather in this place. The circumstances are different. The situation is strange. But our Father, we still come before a holy God. You have not changed. And whatever changes around us, and however much we change, you are the unchanging God. And because of that, we have the assurance that you are still the God of grace and mercy and love. And so we come gratefully into your presence. We come thankfully because we know that we can only do so because the Lord Jesus Christ has paid the price for sin at the place called Calvary. We thank you that we have an access into your presence. We come not with trembling, and with the thought, if I perish, I perish like Esther of old, hoping indeed that the golden scepter might be held out. But we thank you that the welcome is already there. It is the welcome of the hands that were pierced. 
at the place called Calvary. And our blessed Lord says, Come unto me, all you who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So we thank you for that gracious invitation. And we come tonight. We come with faith in our hearts, with a love for the Word of God and the people of God and the Church of God. And we come, our Father, asking that you will help us tonight, not merely to understand your Word, but to hear your voice and to be drawn ever closer to our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for friends who cannot be with us because of health difficulties. And we pray for those that we know who are passing through very difficult situations. And we would, our Father, uh, tonight particularly uh, remember Graham and Enid in the recent losses of a wife and a husband. And Father, we pray that you would grant comfort uh, to them. We also pray again for our dear brother David Field, who is still on well, and we commend him to you. We thank you for the love he and his church have for this place, and we pray for the one appointed to take his place tonight. Uh, Lord, that your voice might be heard there, and your people might be blessed. And Father, in these troubled times, we do pray. We pray for the situation in the United States. We pray that there might be peace, Lord. We pray that all might recognise that there is only one human race. We are not divided into black and white or brown or yellow. But our Father, the divisions that we have are divisions that we have made. Because you see us as one people, one people in need of Christ. One uh, human kind Lord who need to know that we are sinners and that there is only one Saviour, and his name is Jesus. To remember, our Father, that in the Scriptures uh, we were taught to show love to our neighbour. And the question was asked, who is my neighbour? And the illustration that the Lord Jesus gave was one of two people who were diametrically opposed, religiously opposed, and hated each other, and yet the one who was hated showed love and kindness to the one who would have hated him. And Lord, we thank you for that illustration of the Lord Jesus in a story called, so often, the Good Samaritan. Lord, the scripture certainly says, just says he was a Samaritan, not that he was good. For as Jesus reminded us, there is none good but one, and that is God. And we thank you, Lord, that our hope of heaven tonight is not based upon being good or even being better than someone else. It is based upon the righteous one, Jesus Christ the righteous, who gave himself for our sins. And we give you thanks for him in the Saviour's name. Amen. Let's read then the second part of Acts chapter 7, a reading from verse 17 to verse 36. The book of the Acts and chapter 7, continuing where we left off this morning from verse 17. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. At this time Moses was born and was well pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But well, when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now when he was forty years old, he came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, 
He defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbour wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me, as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. And when forty years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marvelled at the sight, and as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. And God will bless his word. Now, Jean... What have you got for us to share as a small group this evening? Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for your singing this morning. Uh, this evening, we're going to use our mission phrase. And if you'd like to turn to number 915, open our eyes, Lord, we pray. Enlighten heart. That as we read your word today, we may its treasures find. And then there's verses 2, 3, and 4. And these are the words that are taken from Psalm 119. But the music was written by Jeremiah Clark, and he was born 1674 and died. 
you. It's lovely. Thank you very much. As Stephen continues with what is called his defence, although as we saw this morning it's not a defence in the normal sense of the word, but as he continues with his statement while he's on trial before the highest religious court in the land, because even though the Romans were in control at that time, there was a considerable amount of freedom given to the high priest. They had their own uh, temple um, uh, guard, as it were, and they were able to judge certain matters. They were not, of course, allowed to put anyone to death, but oh, that's actually what happened here, which was why, of course, they took Jesus to Pilate um, to get a death sentence carried out. But Stephen is continuing to demonstrate from the nation's history how the purposes of God had been worked out, yet the people had so often missed seeing his hand. And we began to see this morning in relating the things that happened to Abraham and Joseph, how their forefathers, just like they were doing now, had failed to see God's purposes and above all had failed to recognise the men who God sent to deliver them. And of course, he's going to increasingly make the point, but they've done it again in rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. Stephen is giving us a potted history of the Old Testament, as we call it, but as we saw this morning, uh, our knowledge of that so-called Old Testament, the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, is absolutely essential for us. We can't really understand the New Testament. You wouldn't be able to understand Romans, for instance, without getting what Paul is saying about Abraham, as we saw. And he's doing more than that, of course. He is seeking to convict them that they have been wrong to crucify Jesus. And he is seeking also to show them that that's their track record as a nation, to reject the deliverers that God sent, and ultimately, of course, to try to do away with them. And we saw that very clearly with Joseph, how his brethren tried to do away with him. They thought he was dead indeed, um, but he appears and they have to bow before him and recognise that he is the one who God has sent to deliver them and indeed to deliver the world. And of course we saw the parallels between Joseph and the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. So he's shown how Joseph's brethren rejected him in the verses that we read this morning. Now he will show how the people again failed to see God's man when Moses came. And they failed to see that Moses was to be their deliverer, their saviour, as it were. So we've got a refresher course in Bible history, as it were, and this is part two. And our first point, and I divided this into lessons, lesson three and lesson four tonight. Lesson three is the second part of what we had in lesson two. Lesson two was how not to treat the man who God sends. And of course, he's leading up to point out that they have been wrong in their treatment of Jesus. How not to treat the man God sends, number two. And now it's not Joseph, but it's Moses. And as Moses' brothers rejected him, 
so the pattern is now to be, sorry, Joseph's brothers rejected him, so the pattern is now to be repeated with Moses. The circumstances are different, but again there is a failure. This first, first of all, with a pagan pharaoh who did not know Joseph. That is so very clear, isn't it, in verse 18 of our reading. The time of the promise drew near. What was that? The promise to Abraham. But Abraham's descendants would become the owners of that land under God. But God would bring his people after 400 years. He would bring them out and he would take them into that land where Abraham came. Abraham the Hebrew came as a, a, a stranger as we saw this morning. Redeemed by God out of the pagan life in Ur of the Chaldees. Uh, brought through Haran. And then after a period of time when he was already getting old. He is now in the land that is called Israel. And the promise is given to him. And all he's got there is a cave that he's bought to bury his dead in. But a promise is given to him that one day his descendants will be in that land. And he didn't have any descendants. And God miraculously brought an Isaac. And that was a miraculous birth. And when we come to Moses, we see how Moses lived miraculously. Because if you go to Exodus chapter 2, he should have died, of course. He was a male child. This other pharaoh, this other king, verse 18, arose who did not know Joseph. And this Pharaoh got worried because he saw that the people were growing in number. And he saw that there was a danger that they might take over. Now the interesting thing is this, and it rather depends on when you place the Exodus. If you place the Exodus 1400 or so BC, then you will come to the conclusion which Pharaoh this was and who his daughter was. If, however, like many eminent men who would disagree with me, and I have respect for those who understand things differently, and some of them know an awful lot more than me, you think that the Exodus was 1250 BC, which of course is later because you're counting down BC, you've got that of course. That's, that's obvious. So if it was 150 or so years later, then it doesn't quite sort of fit in and we can't have all the answers. But whenever it was, the fact was that the time of the promise drew near, verse 17. A promise, not just of man, but a promise of God. A promise of God that Abraham's descendants, and that promise was given, you read, Genesis 12, you read Genesis 15, you read Genesis 17, that promise was given when Abraham did not have a son. God discounted Ishmael. Now that would be a problem if I had some of our Islamic friends here tonight. They would want to shout me down because their understanding, of course, is it was Ish Ishmael who was the seed. And they get that, of course, because of their descendants and they want to, they want to see that. Uh, that's how they understand it. But our Bible tells us, the Bible that Stephen had, he had, he had probably, most likely, the Greek version of it, the LXX or the Septuagint version. And it's interesting when you read what is said here, and Luke, of course, has put it, into Greek and we've translated it into English and sometimes we lose a bit. It's interesting that in these verses you've got quotations from that Septuagint version, that LXX, but so called by the way because there were 70 scholars who put it together, this Greek version of the Old Testament. And you have also got stuff that comes from the Hebrew version, the Tanakh, the Masoret uh, Bible. Uh, they put in the vowel points, and that's one of the problems with Hebrew. And I'm not a Greek scholar, but I'm certainly not a Hebrew scholar. 
and I have to lean on those who know far more. But there's a mixture in some of these verses of stuff that Stephen was quoting straight out of the version uh, that, that he would be familiar with, the Greek version. But also there are verses here which aren't in that Greek version. And in fact, if you pick up a copy of the Septuagint of that version, that Greek speaking version, that Greek version of the Old Testament, you will find that the chapters and verse divisions are different because there's bits missing from it. And it's not, that's why it's not the same. And that's why many of the quotations in your New Testament, because they came from the Greek version, are different than what you will read in your Old Testament. Right, having set that groundwork then, what Stephen is saying is what we can glean from the book of Exodus. This other king, this new pharaoh, this new pharaoh who in, fa in fact, again, if you see this as 1250, he would have actually been an Assyrian. That is not the Assyrians of the later times of the Book of Kings, but the forerunners of that nation. He would have actually been somebody who would conquer the Egypt of that time. And that would make sense that another king arose who didn't know anything about Joseph because he was a foreign king. And if indeed we are talking something like 1400 BC, that foreign king, that foreign pharaoh, didn't have a son. He had a daughter. And after his death, that daughter became co-regent with another relative of the country. As I say, it depends where you place the exodus, but that's one possible explanation. But whatever, this was somebody, and if you said to him, ah, but Joseph, Joseph was a Hebrew. You can't harm all these people. If it wasn't for Joseph, we'd all be dead. In fact, we'd never have been born because our fathers would have died. Our grandfathers would have died of starvation. And everybody in the world would have died because there was this massive famine and it was all the wisdom and the care of Joseph that meant that we were preserved. Joseph was our saviour. That is what they would have said. But this king didn't know anything about this Joseph. And therefore, he gets concerned. And he says, these people, these Hebrew people that are living amongst us, they're growing. 75 came down, verse 14, and now there are thousands of them. And it's been estimated that along with one or two foreigners they took with them, that on the Exodus there were something like two to two and a half million people. That was how much they had grown, and they had grown God's promises, they had grown from one man who himself came out of a pagan background and that was Abraham. Wow! Doesn't the Bible make you say wow sometimes? God promised and God's promises will be kept. And let that encourage you, my dear friend, tonight. If you're worried about getting COVID-19, if you're worried about the fact that the the country is falling apart. If you're worried about our fractured society, what hope is there? The hope is in Jesus. The hope is in the God who makes promises and keeps those promises. Promises that the present president or any future president of the United States cannot do. They talk about Mr. Trump and I'm not taking sides here. But they talk about Mr. Trump being the most powerful man in the world. And then you turn over another page and they talk about Mr. Putin being the most powerful man in the world. I'll tell you who the most powerful person in the universe is and that's God. And the Lord Jesus Christ will reign beside him. And Pharaoh, Pharaoh thought that he could stand against God. So this Pharaoh dealt treacherously with our people, verse 19. And you know Exodus 2? You know the story, don't you? The children know it. 
from younger days, maybe they don't today. The baby in the bulrushes, the baby who could not be hidden as he grew louder and his cries grew louder and he started to crawl, he could not be hidden anymore after three months. And we never think of some of the women in the Bible. We never think of how great some of the women in the Bible. You'll find out later in the Bible that his mother's name was Jochebed. And this woman, she and her husband, knew that they couldn't keep him safe anymore. They couldn't hide him. They knew that the rules were that all the male children were to be killed. This was long before any abortion controversy. This was infanticide they were talking about. This, and it's being talked about now, was killing a child after birth. Yeah. You say, that's shocking. Oh, you say, well, that's, that. that's the old world. That's what they were like. What are we like today, may I ask? It's going on all around us. Euthanasia of old people. Old people in Holland and countries like that frightened to go near a doctor or a hospital. People in this country, without their relative's permission, having DNR, do not resuscitate, written across, without any say in the matter. That's the world we live in. It's no better than... And he said, I want to put a stop to that nation growing. At this time, at this time, Moses was born. And you say, what an awful year we're living in 2020. Just imagine a child being born into this. We don't know, will it go on for months or longer? Just imagine that. What sort of year have we had? There was a joke I saw the other day. The man said that he was going to stay up on the 31st of December. Not to see the new year in, but to see this one out. Yeah, not been a good year, has it? But at this time, at this time, Moses was born. It must have been the worst possible thing. Probably, probably every Hebrew woman would want it to be a boy normally. Because it might be the Messiah. But maybe they were hoping it would be a girl. But it was a boy. Oh no, what is God doing? But God gave them a boy. And that boy was going to be the saviour, if you'll pardon that with a small s, of his people. And so he's laid among the bulrushes. And his sister Miriam looks on to see what will happen. I wonder if she was praying. I wonder if Jochebed, the mother, and I wonder if her father were praying. Praying that instantly that child would be discovered, it would not be instantly killed. Just imagine, you're hiding there and you hear the noise of a party of people coming along. Oh God, what are you doing? It's Pharaoh's daughter. Surely this is the worst person who could discover my baby brother. Thinks Miriam. But the child cried. And it broke the heart of that woman. This is one of the Hebrews' children. She quickly discovered it was a boy. Her father said they must all be killed. But the cry had reached her heart. And the power of God had reached her heart. And she didn't kill that child. She took that child home and raised him in the palace. We could say that Moses was resurrected on that riverbank. He was as good as dead. But he came back from the dead. And you know what Moses' name means? It means drawn out. Yeah. Because, she said, she called him Moses, Pharaoh's daughter. Because I drew him out. She drew him out and he didn't perish there on the riverbank. 
And then he was raised. He started off in an ark in the bulrushes. And he was raised in the glory of the palace. And this was no, this was no ordinary child. At this time Moses was born, and look, look at this, verse 20, and was well pleasing to God, brought up in his father's house for three months. Pharaoh's daughter took him away. The, the words technically mean adopted him, but it's probably non-technical here. She simply took him away, brought him as her own son, verse 21. Look at verse 22, and remember this. When people tell you, oh, Moses was some ignorant person of his time and we shouldn't take any notice of his writings. So he wrote the first five books, the Pentateuch of the Bible. Well, why should we believe somebody who was ignorant? This fellow was not ignorant. He was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now, until today, I thought that meant simply that he was taught everything that the cleverest people in Egypt, and remember the pyramids, by the way, they weren't stupid. They knew their geometry and all sorts of things. And there's an awful lot, of course, as many will be aware, there are Egyptologists who spend all their life studying ancient Egypt. And there are many things that we can learn. But this is something I learned today that I didn't know. And this comes in from other writings. But not only did he learn what the Egyptians could teach him? But he himself was so wise that he actually was involved in almost modernising Egypt. And if any of you have been to the British Museum, or maybe you've got books, have a look at early writing. Have a look at what we call the caveman wrote. And the shape of the letters were pictures. They're called pictographs. But the Egyptians used something else. Anybody remember the word? Hieroglyphics. Yeah. And that writing was much more developed than the pictograph. And this is the interesting thing. There's a considerable body of evidence to show not only that Moses learned everything they knew, but he introduced that writing. And you know what the, the ones who decry the Bible, what we call the modernists, you know what they used to tell you and they can't get away with it now because archaeologists proved them wrong. When I was converted 54 years ago, they were telling us this, Moses couldn't have written the Pentateuch because writing wasn't invented. Well, writing was invented a long time before that. And of course, so many discoveries have been made, people don't even stand up and say stupid things like that anymore to try to decry the Bible. This man was educated and, of course, remember verse 20, he was well-pleasing to God. So he not only had the wisdom that he was taught in homeschooling in the palace, but he had the wisdom that came from God. And look at verse 22. He was mighty in words and deeds. Now time's going on. Let's move on. Notice what happened. Forty years old. He's got everything that he could have. He's in the palace. He's called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He has every benefit that he could have. Think about this. See where Stephen's going on this. He had every benefit that he could have, but when he was 40 years old, verse 23, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. It came into his heart to visit his brethren. Nothing could take away from Moses this fact, but he was still a Hebrew at heart. And they were God's people, and they were his brethren. I want to ask you, I want to ask those who may hear me on the internet later on. I want to ask you this question. How precious are God's people to you and me? Do we want to be with God's people, even if it's at two metres distance? Or can we stay away? 
I read today somebody said, we will never take lightly see you next Sunday after all this. Because in March people were saying that as they left churches. And a good many of them aren't back in church yet. But what was wrong with us? That we were saying see you next Sunday. This early church of the Acts wasn't like that. They had fellowship every day according to chapter 2. They loved the people of God. They wanted to be with the people of God. And anyone who tells me that they love God but don't want to be with his people, there's something wrong. There's something wrong with this Sunday's only Christianity. Oh my God, forgive us. And give us a new heart of love for every one of God's people and for the gospel of Christ. He came into his heart to visit his brother. And what does he see? What does he see? He sees an Egyptian taking out his anger on one of his people. And you might criticise Moses for what he did, but a fight ensues and the Egyptian dies. Verse 25. He supposed but his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. Now wind forward to your New Testament. Wind forward to another deliverer. And it came into his heart to visit his brethren. John chapter 1. He came unto his own people, his own things rather, and his own people received him not. That's Jesus. Jesus, it came into his heart to leave not the glory of the Egyptian palace, but the glory of heaven to bring the message of salvation, first of all, to his own people, as Paul says, Romans 1, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And Jesus comes. Verse 25. Moses came. He supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. Do you see what Stephen's doing? How not to treat the man God sends. Look how his brethren treated Joseph, he's told us. Look how his brethren treated Moses, who made you a ruler. And the judge over us, it was God, of course. And just as Joseph had been rejected and was thought to be dead, but in effect rose from the dead and they bowed down to him. And so they will do when Jesus comes again. In the same way Moses comes, how not to treat the man that God sends. And I want to sound a note of warning to you. I want to say that God raises up leaders. And you may not always like what leaders say to you. But if God has raised them up, you're on very, very dodgy ground. You are on very thin ice. If you think you can reject those who God raises up. And that was the history of the nation. And that is why he's giving them this Bible history lesson. He's not playing for time, you know, so that he won't be killed. He is showing them that they have done to Jesus just what the people did to Joseph and to Moses. They have rejected the man who God sends. The answer was God. And if we reject God-given authority, we reject the God who gave it. Anarchy is bad enough in society. It's awful in the church, I tell you. Yet Moses will not be their deliverer yet. Another 40 years will go through. And he will be in the backside of the desert. He will, when Moses flees in verse 29... He becomes a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. That's interesting. 
Do you know what one of the sons was called? His name means a stranger here. A stranger here. And my mind goes to another writing of Luke, in Luke chapter 24. And the two on, to a, on the road to Emmaus, when he said, what things are you talking about? And he hid from them that he was the Lord who was risen from the dead. And they said, are you only a stranger here? Only a stranger here. And Moses was a stranger in the land of Midian. How much Stephen saw ahead, we do not know. But his enemy, Saul, would become the apostle who would write Romans 11, as I mentioned this morning, and would tell of one who will come again. And Moses came again to the people of Israel and became their deliverer. Then we've got lesson four. And this is the man in the wilderness, verses 30 to 36. And this is Moses. This is the man of God, verse 30. And when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. And the following verses are simply amazing, what they tell us about God as well as about Moses. But these bookend verses that we have in our reading tonight, they start and end with the wilderness. Verse 30. And when 40 years had passed, an angel, the, an angel of the Lord, by the way, Anne isn't really a good translation from the Greek. There are no indefinites in the Greek. It's the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. Interesting. Then look at verse 36, our bookend verse on the other end. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. You see it? Both ends of our passage there in the wilderness. This is Moses. And who was Moses? Psalm 90. The superscription of Psalm 90. Will tell you this. A prayer of Moses. The man of God. And when you look for your Bible. You will find relatively few people. Called the man of God. And Moses was a man of God. And this was a man who they rejected. 40 years before. What do you think there? Can you see what he's getting at? We don't know how much Stephen appreciated of what lay ahead. How much he understood of what Paul would reveal in Romans 11. But you see the parallels. I had a brother in here this morning, couldn't come tonight, but he, he was absolutely amazed. He said, I've just never seen those parallels between Joseph and Jesus before. But look at these parallels between Moses and Jesus. Ah, yes. Moses, a man of God. And he was rejected when he was there in Egypt. Forty years later, God speaks to him. And God says, I'm going to send you to deliver my people. And Moses says, you must be joking. Seriously, God, me? I can't even talk properly. I'm no public speaker. How am I ever going to go into Pharaoh on the behalf of of your people, send somebody else. No, says God, you're the man. You're the man who will be the deliverer. And this man of God is in the wilderness. First of all, he's there. And what's he doing in the land of Midian? Why, he's a shepherd for his father-in-law. Uh -huh. A deliverer who's a shepherd for us? Interesting, you see where it's going? You see where Stephen is going? You've got a history of rejecting people. You rejected Joseph. You rejected Moses. And look what happened. Moses came back and delivered you. Moses became your saviour. But there was a period of time. And it's not 40 years now, is it? 
it's more than 2,000 years, yeah? There was a period of time between those two events. As there was a period of time before the event of the first coming of Jesus and of the second coming of Jesus. And just as they didn't recognise Joseph at first when they went down to Egypt, so they would not recognise Moses at first as the deliverer. Let's move on. So he's first in the wilderness as a rejected deliverer, and secondly, at the end in verse 36, he's there as the successful deliverer. Now, Joe, those who joined our Bible study last Tuesday will recall that our friend Kipwop showed us another man in the wilderness, Jesus at the temptation in the wilderness. Interesting. Moses for 40 years, and what's 40 in your Bible? It's the number of testing. And the Lord Jesus was tested in the wilderness. And Moses for 40 years was forgotten by Israel, but he wasn't forgotten by God. In the wilderness of where? Of Sinai. Now remember what they were charging Stephen with. They were charging him with blasphemy. They were charging with him and charging him with, and they of course charged Jesus with the same thing, with overthrowing the teaching of Moses. But he says, you want to hear about Moses? Well, let me remind you about Moses. Moses was the one who gave the law. And you say that I'm trying to destroy that. And you said the same thing about Jesus. But where was Moses in those years before he was recognised? He was in the wilderness of Sinai. Sinai, where the law would be given. Just what they associated Moses with. Just why they saw reasons to reject Jesus and now to reject Stephen. They were accusing Stephen of speaking against that law. And there Moses has an encounter with God in that first wilderness. And there he is commissioned by the God who has seen and heard. These are amazing words, verse 34. You read them back in Exodus. And if you're struggling today, if you're struggling because of COVID-19, if you're struggling because of the state of things, if you're struggling with the fact that everything seems to have fallen apart and there are people who haven't come back to church and somebody said, will they ever come back? And if you're struggling tonight, I want you to get this. I want you to get what's here in Acts 7 and what's there in Exodus 3. But God sees and God knows and God cares about the situation of his people. Verse 34, I have surely seen, no doubt about it, the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. I am come down. I am. I am. You read it. You read it there from the Hebrew. Not from a Septuagint, but you read it from the Hebrew in Exodus 3. I am come down. What's that? It's a divine name. And you come to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Jump to verse 14. And the Word became flesh, incarnation, and dwelt among us. And God says, I am come down. I am come down. And Stephen drives the point home. The rejected Moses was the one who God sent, verse 35. But wind back a minute, because I want you to see something. I want you to see something about this angel of the Lord. Because there are a number of places in the Old Testament, and some people can't see this. There are a number of places in the Old Testament where words are used which show that it was more than just any angel. 
if you'll pardon me putting it like that. Verse 30, And when forty years had passed, an angel of the Lord. The Greek words there, as back in the Hebrew, indicate that it was someone special who appeared to Moses. And you say, oh, I don't agree with Theophanes, George. I know a dear brother is now with the Lord. <coughs> I see him in glory. And uh, he'll say, well, I was wrong about that, George. I know he will. Because read what we've got in Acts chapter 7. Was that angel an angel, just any angel, or was it someone else? Look at what it says. It's here. You don't have to know Hebrew. You don't have to know Greek. It's here on the surface of your Bible. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire, verse 30. Moses marveled when he saw it. He drew near to observe. Look at the end of verse 31. The voice of the angel came. No, the voice of the Lord came. And he uses the Greek word kurios, Lord saying, verse 32, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. What did Jesus tell us that meant? It's the God of resurrection. He is not the God of the dead, said Jesus. He is the God of the living, got it? Wait a minute. I thought this was an angel. But it's the voice of the Lord. And this voice is saying, I am the God Elohim in the Hebrew. Yeah? I am the God of it. There's a mixture, you see. He's quoting, he's quoting some of it from the Hebrew and some from the Greek. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dare not look. Verse 33, then the Lord. And your Bible will show that's in capital letters. And you won't get that from the Greek translation. But Stephen knew the Hebrew as well. The Lord. Who's that? That's Yahweh. Jehovah as we used to say. Uh, when we didn't understand how they pronounce words that we put a J on. Um, it's Jehovah. It's Yahweh. Said to him. It's the same voice. Do you see that? The angel is the Lord, Kurios, verse 31, is God, Elohim, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, resurrection, yeah. Moses trembled and dared not look, verse 33, and the Lord, Yahweh, said to him, take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Now, taking off the sandals, incidentally, when I was in Romania, it was still the done thing when you went in someone's house to take your shoes off. Like, and it still is in some cultures. It was a sign of respect. So here's a voice to him out of a burning bush, and he is told to show a sign of respect. And, I have surely seen the oppression of my people. The verse I brought to you a few minutes ago. Do you see it? This is a God who cares. This is a God of glory. The God of glory we read in the beginning here in verse 2 this morning. Who appeared unto Abraham. And the God of glory now appears to Moses. And look at the end of verse 34. And now come I will send you to Egypt. And in verses 35 and 36, and time's almost gone, in verses 35 and 36, Stephen drives the point home. The rejected Moses was the one who God sent. They rejected him the first time, but he proves to be the one who God has sent. Will they get it? This Moses, drawn out of the Nile, that's what the name means, drawn out was the one who brought them out of Egypt. Verse 36, he brought them out. After he had shown wonders and signs. Hang on a minute. What was Stephen doing in chapter 6? Showing wonders and signs. 
Who else had they rejected who showed wonders and signs? Jesus, that's right. They had rejected him. And now they were rejecting his servant Stephen. They had killed him. And now they would kill his servant at the end of this chapter. And Moses had spent 40 years rejected as a shepherd in the wilderness. And he spends another 40 years in the wilderness dealing with a people who were disobedient to God at every turn. Is that not right? They saw the wonders and signs, but they still rejected Moses. And when he went up in the mountain, Mount Sinai, to receive the Ten Commandments, when he didn't come back for a bit, they said, we won't bother with him anymore. Let's make an idol. Let's worship like the people did in Egypt. Wow. And all that in a few verses in Acts chapter 7. It's not just a refresher course in Bible history. He's making the point. As a nation, you have rejected those who God sent. And I might say, and it's not stretching it too far, to say that we're no different. And we reject the messengers of God. We reject those who speak from God. And we cry out, give us another Wesley, give us another Whitfield, give us another Spurgeon. But God has given us people who have spoken to our generations. And we have rejected them. But above all, there may be someone in this chapel tonight, or someone who will hear this on the internet. Above all, we have rejected the man who God finally sent, the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses was a man in the wilderness. And Jesus came from that wilderness, sending Satan packing, and went to that cross where he would once and forever defeat Satan. He would destroy him at the power of death. And in a greater way than Moses delivered the people, he would deliver them, says the Bible, who all their lifetime were subject to bondage, to chains, to slavery, by fear of death. And if you think that Stephen was speaking plainly in these verses, in a way not calculated to calm down his accusers, there's more straight talking to come next week when we look at verses 37 to 50. Amen. Jean, have we, have we got a minute or two for, for something else to uh, send us away with? Thank you.
That's new to me, but it's beautiful, isn't it? And if we think of love beyond measure, then we think of Christ, don't we? Father, thank you for love beyond measure. Thank you that you sent us a deliverer, a saviour. And you didn't send a Joseph or even a Moses, but you sent your son. Thank you, Lord. Amen.